Brethren, what would your answer be if I were to ask you the question, why do you go to church services? Why do you go to the feast each year? And why do you go to church services on the Sabbath? Besides the fact that the feast of God, including the Sabbath, are commanded assemblies and holy convocations, why would we say we go to church? I want you to pause and think. Write down your answers. The first thing that comes to your mind. Why did you go to the feast this past year or this year? Well, greetings again, brothers and sisters, as you write down your answers. This is Philip sharing another study that has helped me immensely. And if these studies and helpful, um, if these messages are helpful for you, I hope you, uh, I, I hope you can share them with other people, and understand the fact that I am just sharing this as a Bible study that I've done for myself. I'm really not trying so much to preach to a bunch of people. I don't even know who hears these. I know that a few people do, but I don't know who they are for the most part. So I preach it myself in all of these messages, as I need to grow in these same areas that I'm studying. And I, I found out or figured out that, boy, if they're helping me, maybe they're helping other people as well. So that's why I'm doing this. And so please understand that. I'm really not trying to create a following, as some believe I am. It's just simply not true. Now back to today's questions. If one of your neighbors asked you why you go to the feast, what would you say your purpose was? And do you even know or do you do that purpose at the Feast of Tabernacles? And one more thought, what is the one great purpose or one of the great purposes of your life right now and I feel this would be an appropriate message especially for the opening day of the Feast of Tabernacles if I were giving one this would be certainly one I would be giving at the opening day and really it's an appropriate topic anytime as you'll see now here are some of the answers I got when I asked people what was their purpose for being at the feast or going to church on the Sabbath one said I go because I'm commanded to go I go to learn about God's Word well, you know, that's certainly not a wrong answer. Leviticus 23 says these are holy convocations and commanded assemblies. Someone else said, I go to the feast to learn to fear God more and to rejoice. That's also a very good answer because in my transcript, which you can print off, I give many of the cross-reference verses, which I won't take time in the audio to, to give you, but they're in the transcript. Uh, lots of verses say we go to the feast to rejoice and to learn to fear God. Another one said, I go, to the, I go to the feast to picture the world tomorrow, the millennium, to celebrate in advance as we learn, to, uh, as, we learn as we feast, as we fellowship. Uh, that's also a correct answer. I like the other ones better, but I go to be refreshed for another year. I go to be refreshed for another year is another answer. It's recharging me and my family. It's not a bad answer. Uh, another one says, I go, I don't know, I just always have gone. My friends and family have always gone. They're always there, and we have a good time. It's a family tradition. To me, that's a lame answer, <laughs> but it's one I got. If uh, the one who gave me that answer is listening to this, uh, I'm sorry, but I think that was a lame answer. There were other answers, but those were the most common ones I heard this year. There was one answer, believe it or not, I didn't hear. One answer seldom is probably ever going to be given. I didn't hear it a single time this year, and I want to spend the rest of this study addressing the answer no one gave. Yes, we are here because God said to be here. Yes, we are here, or we were at the feast anyway, celebrating before God the coming millennial reign. But there's so much more when we come together at the feast or at the, any Sabbath service. Let's see what others in the Bible have said. And if I had been assigned an opening night message at the feast, I probably would have given this as my opening night or opening day message. Turn now to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14. In the new millennial reign of a thousand years, the reign of Jesus Christ, the reason in Zechariah 14 that God gives that the people will come up to the feast in Jerusalem is clearly stated. And should we not have this foremost in our minds today as well? In Zechariah 14, verses 16 and 17. I hope you're there. Zechariah 14, verses 16 and 17. <clears throat> it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which come up against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king. Did you get that? They shall go up from year to year to worship. To worship the king, the Lord of hosts and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth who do not come to Jerusalem to worship 
the king, the eternal of hosts. Notice the king who's going to be king on the earth at that time. We know that's Jesus Christ. It's also called the Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, the Yahweh. On them there shall be no rain. The king they will be worshiping during the millennium is Jesus Christ. King Jesus is also God. He is Yahweh. He is the Lord. He is the eternal. He is fully God. He is fully the God, fully part of the one true God and worthy of worship. And here's the point. We go to church services and to the Feast of Tabernacles primarily for one thing that's like an umbrella over all the other sub-reasons. We go to worship King Jesus and God Almighty. Those of you who have been to dozens of feasts, are you consciously thinking of worshiping God when you go to the feast or when you go to Sabbath services? Those of you who are children and teenagers, uh, are, are, are you there consciously thinking of worshiping King Jesus? Those of you who are over age 70 or over 50, are you worshiping God and conscious of it? Do you know whether you're 7 or 70, God wants your worship? Please turn now to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. <clears throat> In John chapter 4, Jesus is uh, teaching the Samaritan woman at the well that he was uh, talking to alone here and uh, here was part of the dialogue we pick up in verse 19 and we'll go to verse 24 John 4 verse 19 to 24 as they uh, got on the topic of worshiping God the woman said to him sir I perceive that you're a prophet our fathers worshiped on this mountain and you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. The time is coming, she says. You worship, he says, you worship what you don't know. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is. Notice what he's saying. Two thousand years ago, our Savior Jesus Christ said the hour is now here. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now let's read part of that again in verse 23. The hour is coming, and now is, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking. He wants to find such to worship Him. He wants us worshiping Him in spirit and truth. You'll see that worship is much more than praying. It's much more than going to church services. Much more than hearing a sermon. It's much more, brethren. Worshiping in spirit includes the fact we intimately have come to meet, to see, and to know God. And the worship is causing massive changes in our lives to a life of holiness. And now let Jesus' words sink in. New covenant worship is not limited to a place like a church building or a city or Jerusalem. It's not limited to an event or to a time. Though, of course, we also do some worshiping in certain locations and times and events like the Holy Days and the Feast. Now, but it's not limited to those times, okay? People would go to Jerusalem to worship. And uh, Jesus is saying that the uh, time is coming that he wants worship in spirit and truth and not, not in a mountain, not on, uh, not on Mount Zion, not, on, uh, not in a city, no, no, no particular place. Remember, the old covenant worshipers went to Jerusalem to worship. Worship was conducted in the temple or tabernacle. Even today, too many think worship should be in church buildings or while kneeling at a church pew inside a church building. Jesus said that's no longer so. And I hope you really grasp that, brethren. As far as worshiping in truth goes, if you turn to John 8, verses 31 and 32 with me, John 8, verses 31 and 32, we'll see that truth has to do with what God's Word actually says. Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the life, and the truth. And, and, and then obeying what we learn... Doctrine, which simply means teaching, right teaching, is important as long as we don't use it as a tool to be divisive or divisive. There comes a time when sometimes I think we have to agree to disagree with other Christians if we can't have a consensus on doctrine. Uh, and some things are not even salvational issues. Some things are, are discussions about prophecy. 
or uh, speculation, things like that. And uh, those are not things that we should uh, be divided over. Now in John 8, verses 31 and 32, it says, Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So one of the definitions of a disciple of Jesus Christ, a true disciple, is that they abide, they obey, they keep God's truth. I do have a sermon on the World Wide Web, uh, lightontherock.com. I do have a sermon on their title, The Signs of True Disciples. I would advise you to hear it. I think I listed five signs. Uh, this verse gives one of those signs of a true disciple, that a true disciple is somebody abiding in the Word of God, obeying it, knowing it, and keeping the Word of God, the truth. More truth and understanding is often given to us by God as we abide in the Word He's already given us. When we refuse to obey what we see, the light of God's Word gets dimmer and eventually goes out. We see less and less. In Job 18, verse 5, it says the light of the wicked goes out. The insight, the ability to see truth goes out if we don't apply what we already know. But back to the original question, why do we go to church or to the feast? Of course, you also know that you and I are the church. We are the ecclesia of the called out ones. It's kind of ridiculous in a way to talk about going to church when you are the church. But you know the, the way I mean that, I think. Now, keep in mind also that the parents of Samuel, the prophet Samuel, it says also the parents went up to Jerusalem every year, says in 1 Samuel 1, 3, to worship, to worship. Now, wonder, I wonder why, when I ask the question, why are we here at the Feast of Tabernacles, or why are we here on Sabbath services, or why are you listening to this recording either on the web or by cassette tape or however you do it, I wonder why I hear so little of this answer, I'm here to worship. Do we even know what worship means? Are we, are we worshipers? Now jump to Acts 8. When we go to the feast or to Sabbath services, do we consciously think in terms of I'm going over there to worship God? In Acts 8, verses 26 to 28, Acts 8, verses 26 to 28, talking about the evangelist Philip. <clears throat> Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Acts 8:26, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace the queen of Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. So it says that he also had come to Jerusalem, not just to keep the feast, not just to have a commanded assembly, not just to be there with friends, but he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now we'll define worship in a little while. But for now, let's really cement the point that we come before God in church services to worship. John 12, 20, you can turn to these later on. John 12:20. there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. John 12:20. Turn with me to Acts 24. Acts 24, verses 10 to 14. Paul here is uh, talking to the governor, sort of a court trial in a sense, a meeting with the governor. And uh, Acts 24, verses 10 to 14. Now this is long after Christ was resurrected. If you think that worshiping and going to a place to worship, if you take what Jesus said, the time is coming when they won't worship in Jerusalem or in this mountain, but in spirit and in truth, uh, to mean that we are not ever to think of worshiping in a place or keeping the holy days or anything like that. Here's what Paul said many, many years after Jesus' statement in Acts 24, verses 10 to 14. And then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it is no more than twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem to, what? To worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city. I'm continuing in Acts 24, verse 13. Nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. 
But this I confess to you, that according to the way, God's way is a way, God's truth, God's, God's truth is a way of life, brethren. According to the way which they call a sect, a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things written in the law and in the prophets. So there you have it from Paul himself saying that he was also in Jerusalem to worship, that he was part of a malign sect, that he believed everything written in the law and the prophets. And so when you and I are at Sabbath services or at the feast, is worshiping God a conscious thought all seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles and on the Holy Eighth Day as well? That's the theme of this message. Do we even think of the word worship when we go to church services? Worship is really something we do all the time, as you'll see. Even when we get up in the morning, worshiping God should frequently be on our minds. Now, what is worship? Many churchgoers think of worship as being the time of hymn singing, especially among Protestant churches. Worship is so much more, brethren. The word worship is found often in the Bible, almost 200 times in the Old Testament. Nowhere, though, is it clearly defined, except by its usage of the word. When I say 172 times it's found, that's the Greek, I mean the Hebrew, I mean the Hebrew word for worship is used that many times. It's sometimes translated into other English words, but the, the Hebrew is used 172 times. And when we study every time the word worship is used in the Bible, we find that the vast majority of those references refer to a time, and I'll get this, of profound bowing down, even prostrating oneself on the ground at the time combined with an intensely humble prayer and then followed often by praise or song or other activities, sometimes by shouts. Now note this, worship eventually turned into rote ritual acts, just rote activities of going to church, praying, offering a sacrifice, and then going home and going back to the same old life without any change. Frankly, not a lot of different in modern worship we go to church we sing we pray we listen to a sermon and we think we've worshiped god have we you'll soon see that god actually are you ready for this denounces that as often being meaningless worship to him keep in mind that as we continue what i've just said my point is this merely going to church merely praying is not the kind of worship that God is seeking from us. In the Old Testament, the basic word translated worship is used almost 200 times, used 172 times. Its basic meaning is to bow down with deep awe, reverence, and respect. In Hebrew, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew is shakah, S-H-A-C-H-A-H, S-H-A-C-H-A-H, shakah, it's, it's the way it's pronounced, or shakah. It's a primitive root it means to depress, to prostrate, to lay down flat. It's translated in the King James as to bow yourself down, to crouch, to fall down flat, to humbly beseech, to do reverence, to make, to stoop, to worship. And Strong's Concordance uh, translates the word worship as to fawn or crouch, to literally or figuratively prostrate oneself in homage, to do reverence, to adore. So we're already seeing how the word being prostrate or worship has a lot to do with being actually laid down flat. Bowed down position is associated with worship. Worship means to bow down. And that kept hitting me as I was researching this. Merely bowing down, however, meant nothing by itself if it wasn't accompanied by a humble heart and having your whole heart in it and a changed life of obedience, as you'll see. When we come to the Greek New Testament, the key word for worship is proskunio, or proskuneo, and, and it's used mostly in the Gospels 26 times in terms of worshiping Jesus himself. It's also used frequently in the book of Revelation, again in terms of worshiping God and Jesus, and it's used also, of course, for false worship of Satan and his representatives. So the original meaning of worship was about bowing our heads and our bodies. Bowing the head. Now, with that in mind... Excuse me. With that in mind, 
I want to show you that there are also many verses that show bowing one's head right to the pavement, to the floor, to the carpet, was fairly frequent. <clears throat> that is so unwestern. We identify that kind of activity more with, let's say, Muslim activity. And that's why I want to recommend we start doing it because it is so unwestern, but it's so biblical. It helps us put ourselves in a very humble attitude, I think, if we... If we do it, I suggest you do your own study on the word worship under this after this message. And certainly they did not bow to the ground every time. Sometimes they just bowed their head. Many times they just bowed their head. But I think you'll find it helpful. I really believe you'll find it helpful to from time to time. Prostate yourself in prayer. I mean, if you can, if your body allows you to do it, it's a good stretching uh, motion. But I mean, get your head right on the carpet, not just on the bedside. But right on the carpet once in a while and just see how it makes your heart feel when you know you're, you're bowing just right down flat your head right on the pavement or on the carpet you'll find that deep and proper worship often followed a profound meeting with God the first time the Hebrew word shakoff for worship is used in the Bible turn now to Genesis 18 it's actually translated as bowed it's found in Genesis 18 the first couple verses Genesis 18. It's when Abraham meets God standing at his door, at, the, at his tent door. And I want you to grasp deeply that worship happens when we actually meet God, when we have a face-to-face, -face, a one-on-one -on -one with God. I don't believe we'll worship fully until we've had our own meeting with God. I don't mean we have to see him physically right there in front of us. But I don't believe we'll worship fully until we've had our meeting with God. I'm going to show that to you in the next five or ten minutes here. In Genesis 18, verses 1 and 2. Genesis 18, verses 1 and 2. Then the Eternal. This is God Almighty. This is Yahweh. Then the Eternal appeared to him, to Abraham, by the tebrant trees of Mamre, as he was sitting in the tent door in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing by him. And when he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them, and worshipped, is the, is the Hebrew, and bowed himself, is worship, shaka, to the ground, worshipped, to the ground. We miss that in the English, it's often translated bow, bowed. The word there is shaka, usually translated worshipped. Abraham meets God in Genesis 18. He's taken, he is so taken by the presence of the holy God that he immediately prostrate, prostrates himself and worships. If you want to deeply worship, it's most likely going to happen when you have had your own personal one-on-one -on -one meeting with God. God does that in a lot of ways, a lot of circumstances. You may not literally see God, but you will know God is dealing with you. It may be a severe trial. It may be an awesome blessing. It can be a, an act of deliverance, an answered prayer. And when you know that God was there, you will probably worship. Sometimes God has to hit us over the head with a two-by-four before we realize He's dealing with us. I know. Oh, yes, I know. When mere man meets holy God, the response in righteous men, in godly men, is often one of intense worship, with their face not just bowed toward the ground, but even on the ground. Turn now with me to Genesis 24. In Genesis 24, verse 52, in this story, Abraham had sent his servant to go find a bride for Isaac. And I think, by the way, if you haven't heard the uh, message I have called The Mystery of Christ and the Church, especially message number two, there's some very intriguing things about this journey this, this servant made. I won't go into them this time. But please listen to that. You'll find a lot there. Anyway, we read how this servant was so impressed and so awed by how God had blessed his trip, uh, trip and had led him to Rebekah, uh, who, whose father you know, lived with uh, Beth, Bethuel, which means house of God. And it's just an amazing thing. In Genesis 24, verse 52, it came to pass, verse 52, when Abraham's servant heard their words, we're going to let her go back now with him, that he worshipped, he bowed himself, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. Imagine doing that. You and I are talking and you say something that I am so awed by. I feel that God is, is inspiring you to say that. 
and then I get on the ground and I just put my head right on the pavement, right on the dirt, right on the carpet, wherever we are, what would you think of me today if I did that? Abraham's servant did that. Maybe we should do that more often, but we're so Western, aren't we? We're so formal. Oh, they might think I'm kind of odd, so we don't. Turn now with me to Second Chronicles 7. Another example of the dedication of the temple that Solomon was building for God and was dedicating at the Feast of Tabernacles that year. In, uh, in Second Chronicles 6, he gives this awesome prayer. He just prayed a beautiful prayer of dedication. His arms lifted up to heaven in verse 12 of chapter 6, 2 Chronicles 6, 12. And finally he finishes this awesome prayer. Solomon started so beautifully. Let's pick up now in 2 Chronicles 7. <clears throat> okay, we're in 2 Chronicles 7, now verse 1. And when Solomon had finished praying, when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifice they had there, and the glory of the eternal filled the temple. And the priest could not enter the house of the Lord, that's the temple, because the glory of the eternal had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel, the Israelites, saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and praised the eternal saying, For he is good, his mercy endures forever. Israel met God on this day, and they worshipped with their faces right on the ground. Brethren, again, I want to suggest, if you haven't prayed in a while with your face right on the carpet, right on the ground, with your head right on the ground, do it at least once a day or one, uh, several times a week as you pray. If you want to know how to worship, ask God to lead you to an encounter with him, but in his mercy, and to lead you to a deep repentance and to change your life with that encounter. Worship will follow if you're seeking it. I mean, Abraham had this encounter with God and he's bowing down. Uh, this servant had the encounter with God. He's bowing down. The Israelites saw God uh, through the cloud and the fire come down into the temple and they worship God. And you and I can worship God if we have our encounter with God, if we haven't already. Disciples, turn now to Matthew 28, verses 8 and 9. Matthew 28, verses 8 and 9. This is after the resurrection of our Lord. The disciples worshipped in this very reverent same way, even in New Testament times, even after Jesus had talked about worshipping in spirit and truth, even after the resurrection. We're now in New Covenant times. The disciples, it says in Matthew 28, verses 8 and 9, And they, the women disciples, departed quickly from the empty sepulcher that they had just gone to with fear and great joy. And I think they talked to an angel here who had said he's not here and so forth. And they did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell the disciples, the other disciples, the males, behold, Jesus met them saying, all hail. Matthew 28, verse 9. And they came and held him by the feet. That means they're bowed right down to the ground, brethren. They're holding him by his feet. And worshipped him. Would we have done that? I sure hope so. Turn now to Revelation 7. Revelation 7. Even awesome spirit beings in front and around the throne of God worship with faces to the ground. Revelation 7, verses, verse 11. Revelation 7:11. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures. We have 24 elders who are, who are impressive spirit beings right around God's throne. You know, they're kind of like spiritual counselors or something. I don't know what exactly their focus is and 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 role is, but also you have these four living creatures, and uh, you know, impressive cherubim. There's seraphim. There are other other creatures there. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. That's Revelation 7:11, and it's repeated in Revelation 19, verse 4. Brethren, we can't and we won't fully worship with bowed down hearts until we have met God personally, one-on-one, -on -one, intimately. And when we do, we'll feel like taking off our shoes, bowing down to the ground, and living a completely changed life that pleases Him. But, of course, we have to stay the course. 
One thing I see over and over in the Bible, those who seem to have most perfectly worshipped God were more often men and women, listen carefully, who had nothing to offer God. They had been mean. They had been sinful. They had been cruel. They'd been felons and whores, rejects of the world. When God decides to call them, confront them, and use them. And then we see God's glory in their lives, their lives that they can't point to anything in themselves as being a reason why and how God was using them because they had nothing left to offer. They were the rejects of the world. They had nothing to offer God. So whatever they accomplished after their meeting with God was by His glory, was by His power. So many of the great men and women in the Bible, not all of them, but so many of them, had been complete and utter failures. So far, when God, out of the depth of their depravity and depression and evil, wakes them up, brings them to repentance, and uses them, the world had rejected them. The average person out there wanted nothing to do with them. God's glory is shown after their worst humiliation. Moses was such a man. He'd been a great general for Egypt, conquering much of the northeastern Africa for Egypt. He was exceptionally, the Bible says, exceptionally handsome a physically large and strong man with lots of talents and gifts. And according to Acts 7, verses 20 to 35, in Stephen's uh, sermon in Acts 7, 20 to 35, Moses must have uh, had an inkling that he was going to be a deliverer. So at age 40, he goes down and probably thought he was going to be, that that was going to be the time when Israel would rally around him. You can read that in verse 25, Acts 7, 25. But he was doing it all on his own strengths and talents and, uh, and in his own vanity. And God wasn't ready to use him like that. And God couldn't use Moses like that. But God wasn't done with Moses yet. Moses kills the Egyptian, ends up having to flee for his life as a murderer, a felon. For 40 years, he can only hide out in Midian, doing the despised work of a, the, the, the Egyptians despised being a shepherd. Humiliated, defeated, despised, and nobody, someone the somebodies didn't want around. And you know the story. Moses meets God in the burning bush. And God tells him to show a little respect, take his sandals off. Moses bows and hides his face. God finally could use Moses, Moses, which means drawn out, and this experience completely changed him. You read that story in Exodus 3. In our humiliation and in our rejection, God can finally be seen when we take ourselves out of the picture. Stephen, in Acts 7.35, describes Moses' calling after his meeting with God this way, this Moses, whom they rejected, the Israelites rejected, saying, or originally rejected, who made you a ruler and a judge, is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. Are you rejected by man? Brethren, I know the feeling. But don't give up on God because mankind has given up on you. God's not done with us yet. God's not done with you. He's not done with me yet. If you and I will worship fully with bowed hearts and let his glory be our focus, only time will tell what God can do with you. Isaiah, I don't care if you're in jail hearing this. I don't care what you've done. God says he can put your past as far as the east is from the west. God says he can give you a new life and make you be a new creation in spite of whatever man might say. I believe that. I have hope in that. Isaiah was another who had his meeting with God. You can read about in Isaiah 6, the first four or five verses. And when he sees God high and exalted on his throne with a long train behind him, you know, the, the long cloak and so forth, he felt he was a man of unclean lips. He says, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm gone. I'm, I'm done for, he says. I'm a man of unclean lips. He must have worshipped. What did God do? He cleaned up Isaiah's dirty mouth by Isaiah's own admission and used Isaiah to write one of the most inspiring books of the prophets in the whole Bible. Now turn to the book of Job. Another man who had his meeting with God was a man who was physically very impressive, did all the right things. Nobody could find any fault in him. But I still think you can't read his own words about himself without getting the distinct feeling that Job felt he was the epitome of a perfect man. 
you don't believe me, read Job verses 29, 30, and, I mean, Job chapters 29, 30, 31, 29 to, uh, to 31, sometime to see what I mean. He obviously thought he was a somebody. The old men would rise when he entered. The young men would hide themselves. Those who were mocking him now were men he wouldn't have had even uh, he wouldn't let their fathers even be with his sheep dogs. He says, they don't deserve to be with my dogs. There's some vanity here, brethren. Job 35, especially, Job 31, I mean, especially what a perfect man he felt he was. Count the number of times he says I in Job 31 alone. It's amazing. Job knew all about God, but he didn't know God himself. He was like some of us who know the Lord's book, but we don't know the Lord. God couldn't use Job like this. Though he was outwardly perfect, he was full of himself. If he wasn't, why did Job say after meeting God, I abhor myself? Why would Job say I repent in dust and ashes if he had nothing to repent of? As I've heard over and over in some sermons. It was only after really meeting God. Turn to, with me to Job 40. Job 40. Let's start there was only after meeting God in the tornado, the whirlwind that God was in, and God whittled Job down to size. Hey, you who give words without knowledge, gird up your loins like a man. You know, and his, his, his uh, garments are flying around in this tornado, and he's lost all his weight. He's just skin and bones, full of, you know, full of boils. This was very humiliating, very humbling. And God could finally say, or Job, I mean, could finally say he finally could see God, understand God. We can't see God when we're full of ourselves, when we're full of self-pity, when we're full of sin. We can't, brethren. I've had to learn that. In Job 40, verses 1 to 4, and I'm just sharing with you what I've learned. Job 40, verses 1 to 4, Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him, correct God? Job was, had been contending about God. He who rebukes God, let him answer it. God's really smacking Job with a statement like that. Job answers very humbly. He answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I'll just shut up. I lay my hand over my mouth. Job 40, verses 1 to 4. At this point... Job is coming to see himself correctly as he was seeing God. He is starting to repent, not of what he had done. He didn't have a lot to repent of that way, but of what he was. That's why he said, I am vile. He doesn't say, I've done vile things. He says, I am vile. A human being who falls way short of the glory of God. So God continues working on Job. We come to Job 42 now in verses 5 and 6. Job 42, verses 5 and 6. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself. Here again, not the things he had done, because he had been a pretty good man. I abhor, I hate myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. It's at this point that Job finally is truly worshiping God. If you and I want to worship God... We have to come to see God, meet God. We will abhor ourselves, and now God can come into our lives, shining His glory, and He finally may be able to use us when we're out of His way. Paul said it so well, In my weakness I am made strong. Even Paul, who outwardly did all the things of worship, he was a righteous, I mean, he was a zealous Pharisee, did all the things a worshiper would do. He was at all the holy days. He did all the sacrifices. did all the things people were supposed to do. But only, turn with me to Acts 9, Acts 9, only when Paul personally met Jesus on the road to Damascus and Jesus knocks him off his high horse could Paul finally truly worship God and be a vessel of holy use in his hands. Are you getting the lesson, brethren? Have you met God yet? Let's read it in Acts 9. You want to learn how to worship, we got to meet God. we got to find God. we got to see God. How do you find God? How do you see God? You can ask Him to reveal Himself. 
You can tell him you're seeking him with all your heart because he said, if you seek me with all your heart, you will surely find me. We have to become seekers. And as we meet God, we will be led to true worship. In Acts 9, verses 1 to 6, then Saul, that was his name before Paul, and then Saul, that's his Hebrew name, still breathing threats and murder against all the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, when he was named Paul, by the way, Paul means little, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the, uh, to the synagogues of Damascus. He had found all the Christians he could find in, his, in Jerusalem. He'd bound them already, tortured them. And, uh, and notice in verse 1, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Murder. So that if he found any, it says in verse 2, who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. This guy's pretty mean. Zealous, but mean. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly a light shone around him from heaven, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, Who are you, Lord? It's like saying, Sir, who are you? Then the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And so he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? How awesome of an answer is that? And he goes and fasts three days. I'm going to talk a little more, a lot more about this incident in a sermon I'm going to give on is how you end up that counts. Have you met Jesus yet? Have you had your one-on-one -on -one with your Creator yet? Are you seeking Him enough to have it? So often it's not only after you've hit rock bottom like Moses, like Samson. Like Samson. So often it's only after you've hit rock bottom. That's what I'm trying to say. Moses, like Samson, like the woman caught in the act of adultery, like Paul, like so many, that we do meet God. Brethren, we're not at church, we're not at the feast just to rejoice, just to have a good time, just to hear nice sermons, just to meet brethren. We're not at Sabbath services just to, just to get together. We're not at the feast to see nice places, just to have nice meals. We're here today, and we're at the feast or at Sabbath services and every day to meet God, and then to fall on our faces figuratively, if not literally, before Him and worship. You can also read in Luke 5, verse 8, Luke 5, verse 8, that when God, when Jesus did this great miracle of the overflowing fishes, fish in the nets and so forth, <clears throat> after they've been fishing all night, Peter, a professional fisherman, when he heard the carpenters say, you know what, Peter, um, if you cast on the other side, you'll have some fish. Peter says, I've been fishing all night. Hey, I'm the professional around here. We know what, how to catch fish, but he goes ahead and does what God says, and there's so many fish, it's about ready to sink the boat. They have to bring the other boat in to help him. And when Simon Peter saw it, Luke 5, verse 8, Luke 5, verse 8, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees. He fell down at Jesus' knees. He worshiped, brethren, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He had come. He had seen Jesus before. He had been around Jesus before. But now he sees Jesus. Now he understands God. Now he understands himself. When we come in the light, the light reveals our errors, reveals our dirt on us. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Luke 5, verse 8. And he worshipped. We can also worship ignorantly, as the Athenians did. Remember when Paul was on Mars Hill in Acts 17, verses 22 to 24? He says, I perceive that you are religious or that you're superstitious. And I looked at all the different idols here, and you want to make sure you cover all the bases. And I found one to the unknown God. Acts 17, 22 to 24. And Paul says, Therefore the one you worship w without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Paul is saying to them and to us today, Come to know God. Don't worship him ignorantly. Don't let him be the unknown God to you. You don't get to know someone if you don't spend the time with that person, brethren. 
or that being come to know God see God and meet the true God and then we can begin to worship in truth you don't worship a God you don't know can't be done very well that's what Paul was trying to tell him. and now remember we go to the feast and to church services to worship God there is case after case in the Bible where worship and bowing down reverently even all the way to the ground at times are used I'm not saying that we always have to bow down to the ground I'm not saying that at all brethren but I'm saying that it might be helpful for us to once in a while do it to bow our heads right down to the floor to the carpet my tape is turning over those of you on the internet just wait a second here but uh, so remember we go to the feast remember we go to church services to worship God to worship God there's case after case in the Bible where worship and bowing reverently are used turn now to Matthew 7 turn now to Matthew 7 worship is worthless worship is worthless unless it changes us Paul changed Job changed the Ninevites changed Moses changed and they all did what God told them to do the latest sins by the way changed part way only they were naked what makes you naked it's when you take off your dirty garments and then stop halfway and you don't put on the righteous garments of God that he gives you they quit the evil but they didn't put on the righteousness in Matthew 7 verses 21 to 23 Matthew 7 verses 21 to 23 worship is worthless unless it changes us if we continue to think we can worship one day a week and live in sin we're deceived Matthew 7 verse 21 says not everyone who says to me Lord Lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who does the will of my father in heaven many will say to me in that day Lord Lord have we not prophesied in your name cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name and then I will declare to them I never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness Matthew 7 21 to 23 there are going to be some people saying God we did so many things in your name we called your name out we cast out demons we we prophesied in your name we did so many good things and he'll say I never knew you depart from me you who practice lawlessness I never knew you if you don't change God doesn't know us we're not worshiping him very well be turning now to Isaiah 1 Isaiah 1 we cannot be worshipers one day a week at church services and be practicing lawlessness the other days of the week God won't know us I preach to myself I've had to repent of that also I was one who preached about God taught people but was living years ago in sins which I couldn't seem to shake off I hope and I pray that God has forgiven me now with many years of a, tra a track record behind me putting some sins behind me it's in our humiliation that sometimes we finally see God and he's able to finally use us in whatever way he wants in spite of the naysayers this is God's message from beginning to end true godly worship involves a changed life let's hear what God himself is saying through the prophet Isaiah you want to be a true worshiper here's what it says in Isaiah 1 <clears throat> Isaiah 1 verses 10 to 20 read along with me Isaiah 1 verses 10 to 20 hear the word of the Lord you rulers of Sodom it's talking to uh, Jews the Ju uh, Judah back then and God's comparing to Jerusalem to Sodom it was so evil at the time give ear to the law of our God you people of Gomorrah to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me there are people sacrificing today they sacrifice financially they sacrifice their time they sacrifice in a lot of ways but what good is it God saying I've had enough of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle I don't delight in the blood of bulls or lambs or goats he's saying your religious sacrificing doesn't impress me in verse 12 when you come to appear before me 
Who has required this from you to trample my courts? Bring no more futile, useless sacrifices. Incense, which symbolizes prayer. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbath, the calling of assemblies. I can't endure the iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They're all a trouble to me. I'm weary of bearing them. And when you spread out your hands, he's saying, when you pray to me with your hands uplifted to me, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Why? Why, brethren? Because your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. We may not be out there murdering people, brethren, but when we don't re reconcile with people, when we don't forgive people, when we don't let someone have a new, a new creation in their life, we might as well be having their blood on our hands. Sometimes it's worse than murder. God says, wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. This is what I want, God says. Seek justice. Rebuke the oppressor. Defend the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Now this wonderful creator we have says, Come now and let's reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Brethren, look what it says. We can be worshiping God and all of it be in vain if we're not changing. Turn now to Matthew 15. We can worship God in vain, all for naught also in Matthew 15, verses 7 to 9, if we're not changing, if we're not seeing God, if we're not putting our hearts into our worship. Matthew 15, verses 7 to 9, says, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth. They say all the right things. They honor me with their lips. Oh yeah, they know how to pray a real good public prayer. They know how to give a real good sermon. They know how to write a good article. I preach to myself. I have to be careful of this myself. He says, these people draw near to me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me. Many of them are just doing it for the money. Many of them are not true shepherds. They're hirelings. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So what does he say here? It's, it's in vain are they worshiping me because their heart's not in it. Brethren, we're asleep. We've got to wake up and give our holy God some meaningful worship that, that's with our whole hearts. Worshiping in vain is worship that's rote. It's just ritual. Our hearts aren't in it. You want to know how to worship? Put, put your heart into it. Put your heart into your praying. Put your heart into your singing. Put your heart into listening to services, sermons. Put your heart into worship. When we pray in church, is it in deep worship? Are we consenting in our hearts with what's being said in prayer? Or is it just a ritual? According to our Lord and Master, what we're experiencing deep down in our hearts is the defining essence of godly worship, of true worship. Ask yourself... Has your heart been in your worship lately? True worship is not just a bowed down head. Get this, brethren. Get it, brethren. True worship is a bowed down heart. One that acknowledges we're in the presence of a perfect, holy God. And our hearts are in the worship. Take time as you begin to pray, before you pray even. To realize, like Isaiah and Isaiah 6, that you're going to come before God's presence. Get the picture before you say, Father in heaven. I recommend you also try praying once in a while again with your head right on the carpet. See how that affects the attitude of your heart. In times of deep repentance, or even at times when I felt abandoned by mankind, by my friends, I've at times felt like my heart was shattered. The heart God wants, that He wants us worshiping Him with, I felt my heart was shattered into a million tiny pieces. And in prayer I said, Eternal Holy God, You asked for my whole heart, my heart, my whole heart. Well, it's in a million tiny shards. 
and I scoop them up and I offer them all to you if you can do anything with such a broken heart you know what God's there the um, the other thing God says is that we worship him in vain if we make man-made traditions more important than God's word or what God God's word plainly says that's in verse 9 for example why do we start church services with hymns why not start with humble bowed down prayer first asking God to bless the entire service including the hymns which is also part of worship another for example why do preachers do 95 percent of the speaking that's not what you read in first Corinthians 14 the first Corinthians 14 talks about everybody being involved in or a lot of people involved in it or is there not supposed to be a lot of give and take during the services I know whenever I preached and gave Bible studies I tried my best to have a lot of give and take even with the audience and uh, even during Jesus final supper with the disciples there was a lot of give and take why do ministers have to have an exalted title like reverend holy father or father or rabbi or even mister if that's a requirement in that church to call the ministers mister that becomes a title master it's a form of master Paul was simply Paul Peter was simply Peter we're all brothers and sisters brethren I would never call my physical brother Mr. Shields let alone Holy Father or Reverend holy and reverend is his name it says and I think that's Psalm 111 verse 9 if I remembered correctly I don't have it in my notes right now I'll put it in there though Psalm 111 verse 9 I believe we're to call no man on earth for religious reasons father rabbi master that's what it says in Matthew 23 verses 8 to 12 Matthew 23 verses 8 to 12 those are traditions we got to get rid of them worshiping thus becomes a relationship with our God characterized by a bowed down heart in total surrender turn now to Psalm 5 verse 7 Psalm 5 verse 7 coming before God whether beside your bed in prayer or on your face on your carpet or whether we're singing hymns in church services should always be with reverence very deep respect frankly at times I've let that slip and I've had to at times even repent of it even recently our Western attitudes have made us very sloppy about a bowed down heart in church services Psalm 5 verse 7 but as for me I will come into your house in the multitude of your mercy we should come with a deep sense of knowing we need mercy and be willing to extend mercy to people God says in James 2 13 that if uh, the judgment without mercy will be shown to those who have shown no mercy I want to be merciful so we come before him he says here in the multitude of your mercy in fear of you I will worship toward your holy temple and then verse 11 adds let them shout for joy when did you last shout for joy in worship and then in Psalm 96 turn with me to Psalm 96 verses 8 and 9 Psalm 96 verses 8 and 9 Psalm 96 verse 8 and 9 give to the Lord the glory do his name bring an offering and come into his courts O oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness that'd be worth a sermonette or a sermon sometime the beauty of holiness tremble before him all the earth we should come with a deep deep reverence as we worship God if we understood this worship concept how different would our Sabbath services be how much more gusto would there be in our song service how would we talk with one another before and after services how would we be during the sermon for that matter how would we dress as we come before the King of Kings for that matter I want to say this now too I asked in the beginning why did you go to the Feast of Tabernacles why do you go to Sabbath services when you go to the feast you know that there's always natural scenic wonders or places to go or attractions or gondola rides or some attraction the area is famous for I just want to put this thought into your head there's one attraction we should never miss at the Feast of Tabernacles there's one place we should never avoid and one, one place we just can't avoid going to in fact every day and that one place we cannot afford to miss at the feast is the throne room of God every single day we need to make that an attraction that we go to with our families with ourselves 
In fact, one thing my wife and I have done for years and years is on the fourth or fifth day of the feast, we usually plan nothing, and we just stay home that afternoon, review sermon notes, study, maybe even get an extra hour sleep, catch up so that we're fully refreshed spiritually and physically, so that we're worshiping God on that fourth or fifth day, halfway through the feast, in an extra amount of time, because I know how busy the feast can be. Worship is so much on our minds at the feast and every day that we should lead our families in prayer worship. When we get together with brethren, the worship of God, understanding his word, filling our conversations. Worship should be so much on our minds that God and the thoughts of God permeate almost all our conversations. Sure, we've all failed miserably in the past, as I have sometimes, but that, but what counts is what we're doing now, brethren. When we're taking our shower, getting ready, we're thinking about how we're going to worship the king. When we take the family to church, when we're getting ready for services, when we eat and breathe, when we sing hymns, when we take notes, when we preach, when we listen to preaching, when we take our children outside, when we load up the car, when we go to dinner at the feast, whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, we're trying to do all to his glory as we worship him. Or are we? Brethren, turn now to Revelation 11, verse 1. God right now is taking our measure. God right now is measuring his church, which is the temple of God, as well as the altar, which is the ministers, in other words, as, as well as all of us who are worshiping. Our time of judgment is right now, God says in 1 Peter 4.17. We're being judged right now. The world's going to be judged later, but we're being judged right now. But we're also the temple of God. Notice what it says in Revelation 11, verse 1. There was given me a reed like a measuring rod, or like a means measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. We're being measured, brethren, and the altar. We're the house of God. We're the temple of God. The altar stands for, I think, the ministry, and them that worship therein. So God is taking our measure right now to see if we're worshipers, if we're truly worshipers or not. Now, in my transcript, I'm going to give you lots of, on page 12 of my transcript, lots and lots of verses that show that we are the new covenant temple, that we are the house of God, the house of prayer. We are the church of the living God, the house of God. i got all these verses here. We're also the holy nation of priests. Uh, we're Not just the ministers are priests. We are all priests in the new covenant. And then also show you that we are also the sacrifices. We're to present ourselves as living sacrifices. And so when we're the priest, the sacrifice, and the temple, do you see why Jesus said what he said? That he's going to measure the temple and make sure, make sure that we're, we're all doing our part. Turn now to Hebrews 13, verse 13 to 16. Hebrews 13, verses 13 to 16. Jesus changed the focus away from the group doing outward acts, though, of animal sacrifices in a temple to more the personal act of obedience, the personal act of prayer, the personal act of good deeds, done from a whole heart devoted to bringing our Heavenly Father and Savior a lot of glory. We no longer have an earthly city that's more special than any other. That's why we don't go to Jerusalem for the feast. Paul was inspired to say it better than I am. In Hebrews 13, verse 13 to 16, Therefore let us go out, go forth to him outside the camp, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no, here on earth we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. So that's where we're going now. We're seeking a different city than the physical Jerusalem. Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice this is the kind of sacrifice we're offering today, not the blood of bulls and goats and animals, but the sacrifice of praise to God. Hebrews 13, verse 15, I'm reading. Therefore, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share... For with such sacrifices, sacrifices of what? Doing good and sharing. God is well pleased. You got it, brethren? New covenant worship is very personal. It's from our heart. It's with obedience. Our sacrifices are giving thanks and praise. In fact, Romans 12 says offering yourselves as living sacrifices, our bodies, our lives. And we praise God in every circumstance at all times, knowing that we are His. 
Paul said that we should always be giving thanks for all things. And there's no reference to time, place, or service. It's a sacrifice sometimes to give up how we're really humanly feeling in the so-called bad times and to still thank God anyway from the heart. Oh yeah, <laughs> when we found my son dead on the bed, I did get on my knees and thank God that he was there. Thank God that somehow that was going to work out for good. That was a sacrifice though didn't come easily. Other sacrifices include doing good, sharing, even at times when we have very little ourselves. Paul told the Philippians their money that they'd sent in Philippians 4.18, that the money they'd sent to him was a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice to God. Yeah, God can be very pleased with us as we do these things. I'm going to come out with a sermon soon on the web called, Is God Well Pleased With You? I have it on cassette, but not on the web. And I'll put it on the web. Uh, I'll re-record it here sometime soon. Can God be uh, well pleased with you? I, I hope you'll find it encouraging. I do want to add now the concept that only the one true God can be rightly worshipped. And there's, there's going to be a whole lot more in my transcript. I'm going to take the time here to say that. But just understand, I think most of you know this, that only the one true God can be rightly worshipped. Only God, only one God can be worshipped rightly. Jesus told Satan, worship God and him only shall you serve. Matthew 4, verses 10 and 11. When John was so awed by everything that he tried to worship an angel, the angel said, no, don't, I'm just a fellow servant. Worship God. Revelation 22, verse 9. Worship God. Now, the world worships, uh, will worship the false prophet, the beast power, idols, Satan, everything. Those are false worships. But the very first commandment says, I'm the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. And we also know that God, the Lord your God, is one. Okay, The word there in Hebrew is a cod. And in my notes, you'll get a lot more detail. But I'm just going to say, in, on this particular point anyway, sometimes I say more in the audio. It's not in my notes and vice versa. But uh, I'm just going to say that Jesus himself also was worshipped. I want you to get this. The one God, the one true God, includes God the Father and Jesus Christ. It would have been a sin for Jesus to have let himself be worshipped if he was anything other than part, fully part, fully part of the one true God, the God, the one true God, the Yahweh, the great God. The Bible calls him the great God, calls Jesus the great God. In Titus 2.13, it also refers to the great God as being God the Father. They both are Yahweh. They both are the one true God. They both are so one that they both are worthy of worship. It would have been a tremendous sin for Jesus to have let himself be worshipped as he did over and over as a man even if he was anything other than God in the flesh. If you need convincing that Jesus while a human being was worshipped, just do a concordance study and look up the word worship and you'll see what I mean. I have it here in my notes, all the scriptures, a ton of them, where Jesus was worshipped by the blind man, by the magi, by the angels, by, you know, on and on. So if Jesus was not fully part of the one true God, he would have had to be a separate God, and then we'd have gods instead of one God. Get this, brethren, get it strongly. Jesus is not a God. Jesus is God. Jesus, to my knowledge, is never described in the Bible as a God, but God, fully, completely, without reservation. He is part of the God of the Bible, the one true God, even though his Father is of a higher authority. Now let's get that, now that we're done with that, let's move on. When do we worship? When done properly, if we really understand worship, this attitude of a bowed down heart and head permeates everything we do all the time. Turn with me, if you don't really know the scripture already, 1 Corinthians 10.31, 1 Corinthians 10.31. We want to do what Jesus would do in every situation. In fact, we begin to realize that we understand what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10.31. 
whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, we do to the glory of God. Now, when we're true worshipers, we're aware that every single thing we say and do is either a positive or a negative reflection on God. How many times I've had to repent? How many times I've had a negative reflection on God? How many times I've been a bad ambassador? I'm sharing this because I think many of us need to wake up and admit that we've fallen short in the past, including me, and we must become true worshipers who realize that everything we do either brings God glory or brings Him shame. When you're an encouraging person, you're bringing God glory. That's a form of worship. Worship's not limited to praying. It's not limited to singing or praising. Brethren, it's so much more. Since God is in us and since we're now His temple, think of this. Now think what I'm saying here. A temple was always a temple all the time. We're always a worship temple all the time. Our lives are acts of worship all the time with everything we do. Paul says everything we do is to bring God glory as we worship Him when we eat, when we drink, when we do anything. Everything I do, everything you do as an ambassador for God's kingdom, everything we say is either bringing God's glory, God glory or shame. Even at our weddings, our weddings should be worship services to the one who made marriage. Someone said they felt my daughter Heather's wedding, quote, was nonstop worship from beginning to end. That was a guest we'd invited who said that. I thought I was very pleased that he said that. That pleased me immensely. I had felt that way, and I'd felt that way also about my other daughter's wedding. It was similar in that regard, where God was adored in worship from beginning to end. Are we getting the point? The feast, and in fact our whole life, is not a time of secular fun, or just that. It is a time of celebration. It is a time of fun. It's a time of, but it's also a time of devout worship, God-centered awareness, over and over and over and over. Yeah, we can have go-kart things for the teenagers and bowling activities, and I've arranged a lot of those at many feast sites. Ice skating, roller skating, bowling, dances. I've arranged a lot of that stuff. But that should never take us away from the goal and the uh, awareness that we're really there to worship the King. The concept of worshiping God fills our mind. It's center stage in our lives. By the time we've come home from the feast, we know we didn't just have a few good sermons, a few good meals. We worshiped. And we worshiped a lot, non-stop. Even as we did some sightseeing and fun things for the family, God was center stage in our conversations. And the children heard His name many times a day in reverence. So at the feast we should be able to say we never stopped worshiping. We worshiped a lot. Or did we? Or did we? Brethren, true, true worship of God happens when people become aware they're in God's awesome presence. Elisha was such a man. Remember the story of him asking God to open his nervous servant's eyes to see the thousands of warrior angels and fiery chariots above them that were protecting him? Kids, teenagers, listen right now. Right now, there are angels assigned to guard you. It says in Matthew 18.10. Write it down and I want the kids to read that for themselves. I want you parents to have them read it to, read it to them. They, they're too young to read they have angels assigned to guard them, protect them, and watch over them. You children have your own angels who report to God about you. You children have your own angel. Become aware of that. Realize that that angel is probably hovering over you right now, smiling as we acknowledge their help and their presence. We don't worship them, but we thank God for them. And let's thank them and thank God for them. God wants us aware of Him being around us and His angels and so on, that with God's Holy Spirit in us. Now get this point, brethren. With God's Holy Spirit in us, remember we are but dust of the earth. We are not just standing on holy ground, but since we're made from the dust of the earth, you and I with God in us 
our holy ground. We're growing in awareness of that every every day, I hope, that everything we are, and therefore everything we do that follows from what we are, must be holy and an act that reflects on God and His way and on His family. How would your worship at church services or the feast, how would you worship if you could literally see our king on the stage? If he was standing in front of us during hymn singing, how would we sing? If we were praising him directly with seeing him there with gusto or daydreaming, not even realizing what the words are? How would we dress? How would we pray? How, how low would we bow our heads? How carefully would we listen to the sermons? As from God, being from God, or from someone who might be a little boring that day? I've had to ask myself that too. And repent sometimes. I do always preach to myself. I'm trying to grow in these things. The reason I give these sermons is not to preach at you, brethren, but to share the things I'm learning. I have so far to grow. I'm so weak, brethren. I have so far to grow. I just want to share what I'm learning. And when we pray, are our whole hearts in the praying? Again, look at my transcript, because Paul even says, lifting up holy hands in prayer. In some churches, you'd be accused of being charismatic if you did that. Solomon, though, he raised his hands in prayer. Paul apparently did. God even referred to the Israelites as, when you stretch your hands out to me in Isaiah 1. I think it's a wonderful way to pray sometimes. Maybe not all the time. But read with your own eyes, Nehemiah 8, 6, where it says, As Ezra was blessing God, that all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands and bowing their heads and worshiping with their faces to the ground, with their hands lifted up. And David says in Psalm 141, Let my prayer be set before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. And other ones in Psalm 134, 2, 1 Timothy 2.8 and so many other places. Brethren, let's pray with reverence. Let's sing with our whole heart. In my transcript, I give several places here in Nehemiah and 1 Samuel and 1 Kings where it says the Israelites sang with so much gusto or shouted the hosannas so loudly that the earth shook, it says. In one place it said the earth seemed to split from the noise. We can whoop it up at a football game, but let's be told we're heirs of God and we shrug it off and get bored. We're, what's wrong with that picture? Our forefathers weren't ashamed to shout out praise the eternal or praise the Lord out loud, but boy, we do that today, you'll be accused of being Pentecostal or something. Nothing's right or wrong unless God's Word says it's right or wrong. God's Word gives us many examples of animated worship. Lively worship. Let's wake up and worship the King in song and prayer and praises with arms lifted up if we're led to do so. Psalm 101 says, Make a joyful shout, a joyful noise unto the Lord. Brethren, I mean it. Our Western worship, I think, is much too formal. God enjoys being worshipped in song and praise and prayer, musical instruments, celebration with great joy. Read the last few Psalms, Psalm 147, 48, 49, and 50, 150 I'm talking about. Brethren, do your own study on how God's people worshiped and on what God enjoys as we worship Him, and then don't be shy to do it. God is measuring us. He is watching us to see if we're true worshipers. If we are His temple now, if we are a house of prayer, if we are a house of worship, to see if our lives are that, I'm saying, to see if we're true worshipers or not. So this coming Sabbath, and every moment of every day, and next feast, think about being there to worship the King. And we shall not be worshiping in vain. Don't forget, the hour is coming, and now is, Jesus said, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Let's do as David teaches, and as we sing in church, O come, and let us worship him, and let us bow down with awe. Let's worship with gusto. Let's worship with holy reverence, with our hearts passionately in it, as we seek to praise and worship and bring him all the glory and adoration we possibly can. Brethren, go worship. Go bow your heart. 
go bow your head be holy ground be the holy house of God the holy temple be worship and go meet your God till next time this is your brother and fellow servant Philip